Aquarium at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators at the Sea Lab. And this morning we are chatting with Dr. Judy Stout. Dr. Stout has, she has had a rich and varied career, um, but she is a botanist. And so this morning she is going to chat with us about uh, dune plants, coastal plants, and their importance to uh, dune and dune formation and, and holding a barrier island such as Dolphin Island in place. And um, with that, I'm going to, to let her tell you about the, the plants that we're seeing right here. Okay, thank you, Mendel. I really want to emphasize that we're going to talk about plants, but only because the beach and the dune would not be here without the plants. And this is a very fragile, kind of temporary sort of environment. If you come out here to the beach, you realize that yourself. The sand's moving around. When you take off your glasses, when you get home, you've got salt spray, scum all over your glasses, etc. Your hair is blowing all over the place. It's windy. So you realize what a harsh environment it is. And uh, believe it or not, there are a number of species of flowering plants that have flowers, that make fruits, and make seeds, and reproduce even in this harsh environment. These plants are so well adapted, you probably would not find them anywhere else unless you were particularly cultivating them at your home. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the environment first. If you look up and down, you see the flat beach here with a, a sort of a gentle slope. You can see the waves breaking on the beach. If you get close enough, you see that the waves have sand in them. It's not just water. They look kind of not dirty, but sandy. Um, if you look further down, you can see some breakwaters that have been placed down there to protect the beach from this wave action. And all of our storms, whether it's just winter storms or hurricanes, uh, really produce a lot of energy out here, which keeps the beach fairly empty of anything, of plants. There are some animals that can burrow in the beach and live out here, but there are a few plants that colonize this beach, foredune, uh, pioneer areas, and we call the plants pioneer plants because they are pretty much like the American pioneers. They're pretty brave. Uh, they suffer a lot to, to live here. And st we're standing at a little bit of a hummock here, a little bit of a mound, and probably all of you familiar with the sea oats, which seem to be almost like hay or growing out of the top of this mound here. Sea oats are one of our pioneer plants, and they're very, very important to catching sand. You can see also some other pioneer plants here. This is Iva. These are little baby morning glories. And we'll talk about the morning glories in just a moment. Both the Iva and the morning glories have a little, you can't see it probably on the camera, except it's a little shiny. The leaf's kind of shiny. They have a waxy coating on them. And that protects them from that salt spray that gets on your sunglasses. If it falls on the tissues of the plant, it begins to burn the cells on the outer surface. And without some adaptations, they wouldn't be able to survive that. It would kill them. Because after all, these are where the plants make their food, the photosynthetic surfaces. So they, but they, they, so they have specially adapted leaves, but look how low growing there are. One of the characteristics you'll see of many of the plants out here are low growing or prostrate on the ground. We'll see it how the morning glory grows in just a moment. Because as I say, these are babies. Uh, so that low prostrate growth form is very conspicuous of well adapted beach and dune plants. The others you'll see a lot of things out here in addition to the sea oats which seem to dominate and you don't notice some of the other plants. But we have several species of grasses out here that are also particularly adapted, the beach panic grass, to the sandy and salty environment. Because not only is that salt spray in the air, but it's also in the soil. Of course, the soil's are very sandy, so with rainfalls, the salt kind of washes out somewhat. But 
not only does the salt wash out, but this is a very low nutrient environment because water percolates through the sediment so quickly and so easily that it washes out the nutrients. So we've got moving sand, we've got high wind, we've got salt spray in the air, we've got salt in the soil, and we've got low nutrients. So this is a very uh, unusual plant place for something to be living. I would not necessarily want to live out here full time myself. <laughs> uh, but you can, and the grasses, you can see how, how bending they are and how, they, how readily they're moving around. Even the sea oats, in a, in a heavy storm wind or something, the sea oats will actually bend over and crack at these joints, which are called nodes, and will just fall over. So it doesn't kill the plant. They kind of give in to the physical environment. And you can see this panic grass is almost laying down. And here we have a little hole. We'll see lots of holes in the sand. Uh, most of them are ghost crabs. Mental may know what else is out here. What is this? Hmm. Okay, let's, uh, what's the best way to walk back? Let's walk over this way a little bit. Okay. There's that ghost crab in the, and across the path right there. Ah. Big one. Yeah. The ghost crabs will uh, migrate and move daily from the beach itself to the water line where they're catching food, picking up the dead fish that you dropped. Uh, let's look here just a moment. And they're carrying back to burrows all the way up at the, at the woods. Let me point out while we're standing here of this whole environment here if you that you can see. Turn that way. Yeah. If you look this way to the left over here, you'll see larger trees. They're not only somewhat larger, but the ground they're growing on is higher elevation. So the vegetation has trapped more and more and more sand. And it's farther from the gulf. And it's farther from the water. And then if you look further back, you see lots of trees getting bigger. The ground is getting higher. And you even see tall pine trees. And some of those pine trees are growing behind the dunes in what we call the maritime forest. Um, So we've seen the baby morning glories, the little babies. But here's what they want to go into. This is not a big one. This is the morning glory. It never grows high. Remember, it has the waxy leaves. The, the sand rubs on it. The salt spray gets on it. But here's how important they are. In fact, this end of it's buried. I don't know how far underground it is. But let me get out so you don't have my shadow. Look at that. What do you see hanging out of it? Roots. Roots. See the roots hanging out at every node? Remember the nodes on the sea oats? The joints? And so every four, every two to four inches, this plant is sending down roots that hold the sand. And if we, if we kind of keep an eye out, these things will grow in one year about 20 or 30 feet. And some, in some places where all the babies grow up at the same time, there'll just be a whole mat of morning glories holding the sand in place. And then the other grasses and shrubs will come in behind them and as the mounds get higher. The, the grasses have a, another special, they grow very fast. So as they get buried in the sand, they put up more green leaves, which allow them to make food. So if you try to pull up one of these sea oats, you probably couldn't if you tried to dig it up. The roots are probably a couple feet down in the ground, and it's just continued to grow higher and higher. But in some places, you're prohibited from... Uh, uh, in most places, <laughs> you're prohibited. So let's just say that you shouldn't try to pull up sea oats. I said, if you did that, I'm not saying you should. <laughs> no, it's against the law to disturb them, to collect the plants, or to collect the seed heads. Because, because they're so important. To... <laughs> because they're so important. You can see how uh, prolific they are at producing seeds. Uh, some German nation studies have shown, though, that it's maybe less than 50% of the seeds are viable. 
Oh. So it makes a whole bunch so that a whole bunch will survive. And then of the ones that are viable, how many, uh, the, the, no, no. I don't know. Okay. And things eat them. Yep. Kind of hard to catch. I have seen uh, red winged blackbirds perched on it, eat waving in the wind. Mm -hmm. so. I don't know if you can. There uh, a lot of the sand that we are standing on right now and, and highlighting that has taken these this dune form began just a few years ago. It was deposited there uh, as part of a renourishment project about five years ago. And um, in the uh, northern, north central Gulf of Mexico, as Dr. Stout was pointing out, the waves are sandy. And they are because they're pushing, they are pushing sand in place, but they're also carrying sand uh, that is drifting east to west. So as part of this beach renourishment project, they anticipated that the sand would be carried from the east end of Dolphin Island west. And it has been. And it has been. Yeah, the, the currents, as Mendel said, move it from east to west. The waves kind of hit the beach at an angle. So they bring some sand up, take a little bit back, move it a little bit further down. So they're gradually migrating that sand further to the west on the beach. And the winds move it too. Oh yeah, definitely. And the, you know, the, the winds may shift direction, but the longshore current that flows east to west it's established that way because of the prevailing wind patterns. Yeah, the, our, our dominant wind patterns, and that's not to say it doesn't come from other directions, are out of the southeast. So that's perfect on this stretch of beach. Mm -hmm. And I've read somewhere that I think it takes at least 10 miles an hour to pick up the sand particles, and they just roll and pick mm -hmm. up and blow. You, you've probably been on the beach where you get sand blasted because mm -hmm. the winds are so strong, mm -hmm. and it's picking the sand way up off the ground. So there are a lot of physical factors out here. Well, another part of that project was planting sea oats. Oh, yes. So not Good all point. of these oats were planted. They, the ones that were planted spread. Yeah. But, you know, because of their importance in holding the sand in place, that was a major part of Let's that project. Let's go over here and look at this. I'm going to step on your cord. Per your point, This explains the project and indicates that this is a sanctuary for the plants, but also for the wildlife that live out here and are so dependent on the plants. Of course, the physical environment is dependent on the plants, but therefore then are, are the animals that are out here. Um, look how high this dune has gotten. It's it, taller than this little three and a half foot sign. And it's just a small little t primary dune, just a little four dune, but it's beginning to protect things behind it. It's holding the sand, it's tra trapping the salt spray, and making things a little more favorable behind it. Oh look, see we got long, long trailing morning glories all over the sand. You want to go over there or straight this way? Uh, let's go around. Well, we can cross over, I think, once we get behind this little dune here. Okay. But Take a shot down towards the, the, the bicycles. We're on a uh, public access beach for those who are camping in the campground on Dolphin Island. And there is a boardwalk down a portion of the way to the beach. But you can see what happens when people walk through the vegetation. You can see it has, we have a discontinuation of the sand dunes on either side of this trail. They have equipment down here. You can see vehicle tracks. There was a bulldozer down here this morning. And people walk through this, begin to tear the plants up, tear the roots up. Want to walk over there? Or yeah, around? okay. We can do that. Of course, we So should. we generally discourage walking on the dune plants. We'll, we'll be careful to try to put our feet in the sand if we can. Um, but just for the sake of giving you a closer look at these dune plants, um, you know, we are walking into these dunes. We saw uh, closer to the beach the morning glory and the Iva leaves with the waxy coat. Here's another one that can get to about three feet tall 
it's pretty rugged for it out here. This is a croton or croton. Uh, you see a lot of uh, house plants which are in this genus. It's green on the top. It's silver on the back. I don't know if you can see this or not, but it's covered by scales. You can see where I'm scratching it off. Maybe there you can see the shiny green underneath it. You can really see it on the back. And what these scales do is slow down evaporation from the leaf because water is a, 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 a really critical thing out here. It's so dry. It also slows down, it slows down evaporation and it protects the leaf surface from that salt spray. So you don't find, these things we're talking about, you don't find in people's yards are on the other side of the bee and dune system. They're so well adapted. Um, and I also want to remind folks that you can um, add questions or comments in the comments section and um, we'll uh, look to see if, if anyone has any questions that they have for us. Can you uh, get a shot of that right oh, yeah. there? So that was a um, bench. There was a pavilion here in the spot. Um, this Watch sign climbs up. <laughs> here that you see mostly buried. <laughs> there was a pavilion here that was maybe 20 feet by 20 feet. It actually um, extended past that the end of that bench. Uh, and that was here, you know, um, it's been covered by the sand moving west. So it's a good bit of sand movement. A whole bunch of sand movement. I think in the, uh, on the old topographic maps, some of the sand dunes by, down by the school, kind of in the, uh, the far western end of the dune system. So it was kind of at the furthest extent of the mo sand moving down there before you got to the lower kind of peninsula of mm -hmm. the island. They were over 25 feet tall. So, I mean, it can become quite significant uh, mm -hmm. to protecting whatever's behind it. Right. And because all this comes to work together in a relationship. If you notice off the sides of the trail we're walking on, how many more plants there are, how much more dense they are, there's more variety, elevations get higher, and we start to see a little oak tree over here growing out of the top of this mound. I'd say this mound was what? Six feet, five feet tall, mm -hmm. maybe. But higher above sea level, so here. Yes. Uh -huh. Measuring from sea level a little and higher. And you'll also that. see to the right of it uh, <laughs> some saw palmetto. So things that would not be able to survive in the more rigorous environment closer to the beach are beginning to be protected by the increased elevation and the other plants in front of them. And the pine, I was surprised to notice the pine sprout. I have a question from, oops, let's see if I can pull it up again. Uh, can you see in the sunshine? I can. It was about the Rosemary Beach. Maybe Mendel, Beach. you can pull it up. I, I don't see it on my, uh, I don't see it, but maybe we can just come back to it if we can We're going to get stop it. at some Beach Rosemary in just a moment. So yeah. if you can figure out what the question is, maybe we'll be able to answer it. Yes. Now look at the height of this little oak tree. These, most of these oaks, including those further down the beach, the bigger ones, you can, the ones further down the beach, I should have pointed this out earlier, are kind of sculpted. They're low to the left, which is the nearest the beach, and they're taller to the right. Part of that's because the land under them is taller. The individuals. Not individuals, just the, yes. Uh... But part of that is also because of salt and wind burn. Mm -hmm. It kind of sculpts the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, the dune also tends to take that form. But the individuals form There's that way. There's glory flower. <clears throat> so here's a baby morning glory who hasn't gone very far, but it's so happy it's making a flower, which will make fruits with seeds in it and continue to make more morning glories. Looks just like a morning glory. Oops. If the person who had a question could re-put it in, um, that would be wonderful. And if y'all want to go ahead, I'll see if I can get it up. And when I do, I'll shout it out to y'all. Okay. 
go ahead. Let's take a look here at the um, little small oak trees. Now Mendel said she had been told that were perhaps these were coming up from old trees that were kind of buried in the mound. I don't know that, whether that's true or not. Because they certainly produce acorns, which we'll see later, and grow afresh from new seeds. This is a live oak, and for a long time, uh, scientists thought it was just different because it was in such a harsh environment. But their number of its acorns are different. Uh, other things are different. But one real telling thing is that if you look at the back side of leaves, they're silvery. They've got scales and hairs on them too to prevent evaporation. The edges start curling in also to protect the underside of the leaf. So these are called sand live oaks. And now I think most scientists agree that it's a different species than the big, huge live oaks that are such a feature of coastal southern cities. So if you remember your, uh, your biology lessons about plants, they have pores on the undersides of um, and that's where they, uh, the water transpires. So they don't, the, these two plants don't want to lose a whole lot of water to transpiration, evapotranspiration. Uh, so that is one way of, um, reducing the amount of water they're losing to that. Yeah, they probably have fewer of those pores. Okay, and I have found the question. Can the seaside rosemary, rosemary and beach rosemary be used for cooking? <laughs> it's not truly a rosemary. Um, and it hardly has any fragrance or essential oils in it, so I don't believe that it would um, lend much to a recipe in terms of the flavor. It's called that because it looks like rosemary. A little bit. <laughs> I think the beach heather looks a little bit more like rosemary to me. Yeah. So if you can, yeah, if you can kind of scan across this part of the dune system. This is the beach or dune seaside goldenrod and it was in bud last week and now it is just a meadow of yellow. Uh, as you see goldenrods just everywhere in ditches and roadsides etc. A lot of people think they're allergic to goldenrod. Goldenrod has very large sticky pollen so it doesn't blow in the wind and so if you have allergies this time of year it's probably to pines or ragweed not to goldenrod. All the goldenrod species are probably our most important genus for pollinators. Everything gets on it. It's very, very important. It's Alabama's wildflower. And here we have everyone's favorite. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, sand spurs. You can, yeah, yeah. And just to make it worse, there are two species out here. This looks like the small species and then there's another one that has big spurs about half again as big as those. Now this is a fruit in fact and if you bold enough to tear it open perhaps with perhaps with uh, forceps or something it's got, it, it breaks apart into different little pieces each of which has seeds in it yeah. and the spurs themselves are a means of dispersal so yeah. that if anything, probably a mammal, comes by the plant. It, that one stuck to my shoe. Oh, I know. It was stuck to my skin a while ago. Comes by, it picks up the seeds, oh. it goes somewhere else, and it disperses sock. the seeds. In some places, these are called rockachaws. Called what? Rockachaws. I think it's a Mississippi thing. And I've seen, like, schools that, that have rockachaws as their mascot because what? they're pretty... Uh, they're pretty fearsome. That's oh, what I, I grew up calling them was rockachaws. Yeah. Rockachaws, can you mm -hmm. spell it? Uh, I think it's R-O-C-K-A-C-H-A-W. Well, good. That's something new to know. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what the cheers sound like for the football team. <laughs> right. <laughs> what is Fall this one right here? In Sandsburg. Okay, this is called Catbriar, Greenbriar, or Smilax. And it's called all those things because if you look carefully, look at the length of that briar, that thorn sticking out of it, and they're rock hard. 
speaking of rocks. And it doesn't vine along the stand. It vines on top of plants. You'll see some growing in the plant here. There's a oh okay. yeah, all over That's a good the, place to look at them. Yeah, and they wrap around your legs, and they're they don't go with you like the sand spurs do, but they leave nice they can have little huge roots too. Oh gosh, they have yes, like the one outside the estuary. <laughs> Yes. But the tender grow, I mean, the growing shoots on them are, uh, oh, they, they, there's some the salads. Tender, yeah. So that at that point, they haven't hardened. So she was pointing out how hard these are, but when they first um, are sprouting, they haven't hardened and, and they're edible. Look at the shape of these seaside goldenrods. Each one of them is a little mound. Uh, sometimes this shape is called beach sheep because it looks like a whole herd of sheep out here. And those are all uh, low profile to protect it from moving sand and salt spray. When it's not in flower or in fruit, it's half that height and it's just a little round green mound. But the flowers and the fruiting heads stand up about another foot above it. There's our rosemary. Many places on the beach provide you an easy way to avoid damaging the dunes and the, the beach. And that's by putting in boardwalks. And that's where you should go to the beach. But you can see here, we've got a parallel trumped area where foot traffic has totally denuded it. Most people, a lot of people do use the boardwalk. Um, and we keep stepping off, but we're only doing this temporarily today. There's another little thing here. Well, can I add to that real quickly before sure. we move on off of that topic? Uh, a lot of development. This, is, this has been a, a change in the last 20 or 30 years has, um, like for, I'm talking like condos and, and hotels that are at the beach, they have begun setting them back behind the dunes and then putting access points through the dunes instead of plopping them right on right what on. you know used to be dune and destroying the dunes because we've really come to understand the importance of these dunes to holding this resource a resource that they value in sure. place. Absolutely and the old old timers when Gulf Shores was developed uh, after World War II um, they built their houses cottages beach cottages behind these bigger dunes back here, because they, they didn't have insurance. And they knew that was the smart place to build. Mm -hmm. After Katrina flattened Gulf Shores, they started issuing permits to build where the dunes had been. Mm. Now there's nothing in front of those condos over there. Uh, so they are Im imperiled every time there's a storm. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Beach Heather right here and it might as as Mendel says it might look more like rosemary to you than the rosemary does uh, we've it's just about through flowering but we've seen a few don't see any in, in sight right here and here's a bold a bold and brave <clears throat> pair of little pine trees that the seeds have probably gotten carried out here by squirrels or rabbits or mice and they're trying to make a go of it, and they probably will. Uh, we have a few long leaves on the island, loblolly, and a lot of slash pine. Uh, so this uh, succession in the dune system where um, uh, Dr. Stout referred to it as evolution, so this is kind of how the dunes change and over time sometimes they're growing sometimes they're shrinking so right now uh and and that's really fast on a barrier island on the geologic time scale but if you're Absolutely. thinking in terms of um a plant's life life um you know that that may be a, a slower comparatively slower um, but right now it's growing because of that renourishment so we may see some evidence of that in these plants that would typically grow farther from the gulf sprouting up in in place right here uh, it's a long process it's, it's hard to say at this point in time you know whether that's a reflection of that or whether there is it's just kind of an aberration yeah i have another question um john asks i'm wondering how the boardwalk and the shelter near the beach disappeared 
Did the hurricane blow them away? They got buried by the sand. The so pavilion was taken down and, and it may have had some storm damage, um, but the... We see that being eroded out, back out again out of the sand and it has been previously buried. Mm -hmm. So there's both physical damage as well as be, being lost to the system. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, not only do you see, this is very different than the perspective we saw closer to the beach. Bigger oak trees. Look at the saw palmetto coming in. So from this point, the point of reference where Angela is standing and, and she can paint with the camera, if you point the camera in that direction, you can see grass. So you can see the grass of the primary dune. And then if you just pan around over back to the, um, this kind of, field of um, goldenrod, you see that it's it's not a very, you know, big distance between the two, but we see some kind of dramatic zonation. Right. If we step down here and walk across where that little pine tree, let's see, uh, let's point out something over here first. I mentioned the saw palmettos. Just as we saw those little bitty roots coming out of the morning glory and how important they are to hold the sediment and how deeply rooted the grasses are and they're holding the sediment and we call that sediment stabilization. It prevents erosion from water and wind. Some more turtle action. Hmm. But look at this ugly little trunk looking thing here. This is what is called a rhizome and a rhizome is an underground stem if you track the lower one over to the right, up under the saw palmetto, you'll see where the leaves are coming out for this year. Each year, a new set of leaves comes out at the leading edge of that rhizome. That rhizome would normally be underground. And you can imagine how important that would be to holding sediment. Look how rough it is. Each of these things here is where a leaf had been attacked. But see how it's holding sand and catching sand? This has been eroded out so you can see it, but these rhizomes are extensive all under the mound. <coughs> there's that uh, magnolia too that's uh, in an unusual place for a magnolia. Behind the dunes we have what's called the maritime forest and it becomes much more diverse than things you might find in your in your yard on Dolphin Island or Gulf Shores, one of which is the magnolia. Mm -hmm. And just like that little pine, those two little pine trees are trying to make a go out here, it seems to be doing okay. If we cross over, someone asked about the rosemary, so let's look at the rosemary. Oh, hang on, hang on. You're caught. Uh -oh. gotcha. My tether. This is a seaside, or in fact, I believe it's in the same family with azaleas. I think it's ericaceous. It has boy plants and girl plants, which means that the pollen has to get carried from the boy plant to the girl plant. It has very fine, small pollen that gets blown in the wind, so it works very well. Look how dense the stalks are. Angela, if you look at this one with the cinnamon-colored things along the branch. Oh, you can see it. Oh, you can see, see the pollen coming, coming out. Yeah. I wonder if that shows up on the... I don't know if that shows up or not. Those are boys. Those are stamens where the pollen is found. And there are usually more boys out here than there are girls. But look how many fruits. I think these are last year's fruits. They may be this year's. This is a girl plant. And so uh, the tiny little flowers are kind of hidden against the stem and protected by the leaves that are at the terminal ends of each branch. And these fall on the ground then and take root. One thing that we have found in just a small research project, uh, the ant, there's several species of ants that are common out here. You don't see them much, but they will harvest those little green beads, which have a fleshy coating and carry it down into their burrow and eat the fleshy covering off, bring the seeds back up and throw them back out. So every place there's a little ant height hill when they're ripe, you'll find all the seeds in a circle around it. We poured plaster of Paris in, in one of those burrows, or two or three of them one year, and we dug them up then, which was more than we had anticipated, and it was like 10, 12 feet down in the sand, and it had branches all over the place, and then there were chambers 
where it was storing the rosemary seeds for future use, which is just the relationships out here. Another relationship. You mentioned pollinators on yes. the uh, on the goldenrod, the importance of the goldenrod. To the, I don't know if you can see them um, like flying through the, the frame of the um, no. recording, but we've I've seen gold fritillaries and cloudless sulfur butterflies and buckeye butterflies. Lots of butterflies this time of year. Yep, they're all reproducing, migrating, and doing their thing. And they're, as I say, they're, these are flowering plants. Yeah, and I have not located any in this immediate area, but we do also have um, uh, dune milkweeds that are important yeah, for the monarchs. Yeah. They're usually closer into the stable dunes, mm -hmm. and they are prostrate, and they have waxy coatings on the leaf. Bigger flowers. There's a uh, there's a, a good flowering um, heather. Oh, and there's a butterfly on it actually. Uh, oh, on yeah. the purple, the little purple flowers. That looks like maybe a buckeye. Can you see the it? The purple flowers for the um, the uh, beach heather. Beach heather. Yeah. And that's how they get the name heather. The purple flowers, like yeah. the yeah. And here we have another, we, we saw some of those succulent leaves that were conserving moisture. Here's what you'd expect to find perhaps on a desert. And to many plants, this is an absolute desert. This is our prickly pear cactus. It's easy to see where it gets its common names. And if you try to pick the pears, they are covered, every little dot on there is covered with tiny little spines that are almost impossible to get out of your fingers. Mm -hmm. The long ones are easy to avoid, but it's the yes, little it's ones, ones that will really get you trouble. that will get you. And the leaves are very thick, which I think you actually, um, these are not leaves. Botanically, these are the stem. Mm -hmm. This cactus has lost its leaves to conserve water. It makes its food in the green stems and the green fleshy stems hold the moisture. And then it flowers beautiful bright yellow flowers and makes these fruits. You can make uh, jelly and jam out of the fruits if you're willing to fight the spines. I did it once and got two half pints. Yeah. And I wasn't going to do it again. <laughs> but also here's another funny little relationship. As I say, a lot of these, they're tied together. Look at this dry, dry, crunchy stuff on the ground here. It's very dry right now because we haven't had rain for about a, a, almost a week. But these are lichens, and a lichen is a mutually beneficial, required relationship between usually a green algae, which makes food, and a fungi, which protects the algae. In this environment, you wouldn't find algae. It would be too dry and too hot. But the fungi send out fibers that attach the lichen to the soil and it begins to accumulate organic matter. So actually these lichens are building soil out here and adding organic matter and nutrients to the soil. But you can see how dense they are and how they would also be holding the soil in place. This is the only species I know that grows out on the beach. Uh, lichenologists may know of more. So um, just a, a quick refresher on a reminder of algae. Algae is a photosynth they're photosynthetic, but, the, um, but they're not true plants. They don't have uh, roots or stems. So the fungus kind of functions that way. In right. And the fungus doesn't have chlorophyll or any kind of pigments right, in order yeah. to make food. So, one of them makes food, the other one protects both of them. So we can get a closer look at the uh, goldenrod right here too. Oh yeah. The, the, the buds are just opening, the flowers are not open. They're pretty small as you can imagine looking at the buds. Uh, but you can see how they're growing out of the mound. After it goes to seed, these stalks will break off and it'll go back to just the little round beech sheet mound. And I don't know if you can see it, but those leaves also have the um, like scales on them. Yeah, it's not as dense, and they're a little waxy if you feel them. See how shiny it is? So those are some of the adaptations that these plants have for surviving in a, an environment that's, 
that Watch is out, kind of a you. harsh environment for plants. How are we doing time? But I like to point out, uh, we can go for a few more minutes if you want to um, show a little bit more of this and the and the um, tertiary dune. Yeah. Um, I like to point out too, though, that for those organisms who can survive in, in an environment that's harsh, uh, you know, there are some advantages to that because they don't have as much, you know, competition. Absolutely. From, Absolutely. For, in this case, from other plants. They could say. There's some of the um, prickly pears with some brighter, some more ripe fruit over oh, there. Oh, yes. The red. On the ground over there. The red ripe pears. Mm-hmm. So looking across here, if you uh, recall the way it looked when I pointed out the, the grass from one angle and then we panned over to look at the um, secondary dune, those, um, uh, it was predominantly the goldenrod, uh, but you, if you can recall the height and compare it to what you're seeing for the height of the plants here, the height here is, is quite a bit higher. And you're beginning to see a kind of a forest even, uh, which means it's a lot less harsh environment. So as we get farther from the Gulf and the wind and the salt spray and storm, you know, periodic storm surge, um, it's, it's a little less harsh for these plants farther from the Gulf. <clears throat> and I said one, indica one indication, or I meant say if I didn't, one indication as to how successful they are, well you can obviously see how successful they are as you get further and further from, well they, even the, the um, sea oats get denser and denser and denser and that would not happen if they were not successful. Mm -hmm. But we saw the fruit on the prickly pear, there's flowers on the beech heather, there's fruit forming on the rosemary, and even these little oak trees begin uh, further from the beach, you begin to see where the acorns have been the acorn caps. So even this little scrubby oak, live oak, is happy, it's reproducing. That's what plants survive for. They want to live long enough and be strong enough to flower, make fruits and seeds, and produce a new generation. And they're obviously able to do that here. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to go all the way up here and then uh, we can kind of scan across there and yeah let's go to the and also um is there something that you would kind of like to leave folks with as, as uh you know kind of the broad message of uh, what we're seeing and talking about this oh, morning? Was Larry, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um as a botanist my primary first message is respect for plants they're often overlooked mm -hmm. they're part of your landscape they're part of everything you walk past and drive past and you don't necessarily pay a whole lot of attention. If you're going to the beach, and they may be just getting in your way, so, but respect for them and what they are able to do and how they're able to survive are to me somewhat miraculous. The adaptations are just amazing. Second, in this type of environment, is not just respect for the plants, but understanding the fragile nature of the environment and the very close relationships that the physical environment and the plant community and the animals associated have. It's such a close relationship that to disturb it causes really disastrous effects. Because mm -hmm. if a storm comes through here, the storm water is going to come down this area where people have walked and there's nothing to stop the storm water. Mm -hmm. It'll come through, it'll wash out through here. We see this on the west end of the island where there are side roads cut out to houses. The sand that washes across the island is like, mm -hmm. uh, like a waterfall coming across, across the road. You know, I think that people have a, a subconscious, they're subconsciously affected by plants in a really positive way. I think oh, that people, it may not be a conscious uh, appreciation for plants, but I think that they really add a lot to our quality of life. And you see that reflected in, you know, in the way we landscape things and the way we, uh, you know, enjoy being out in open spaces. And I think, you know, some people are a little more conscious of it and others 
may not be as conscious of that effect that it's having on them, but I think people are really positively affected I, I by plants. I think that's very true, and there have been a number of studies by sociologists and psychologists about the effect of being in nature. Mm -hmm. And the most conspicuous thing in nature is the plants. Mm -hmm. And they are seeing more and more the importance of that during these two years of kind of COVID isolation. Mm -hmm where more and more people are gardening, mm -hmm. they're going outdoors, it's been good for their mental health. Mm -hmm. I, I lead a lot of field trips, particularly with children, I'm seeing more and more young families want to be outside, they want to be in that kind of meditative, soothing, mm -hmm. quiet, natural environment. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very true. So I would, you know, say that too that uh you know we would encourage you to get out and get outside and appreciate the plants in a more conscious way and um you know and and respectfully and and appreciate what they do for us absolutely what would we do without them we'd right. starve to death in the first place <laughs> yeah and then we couldn't breathe right <laughs> very important to us so thank you for uh absolutely. coming out and chatting with us this morning and thank you for joining us it's been a great uh, walk i've enjoyed it and it's been, the weather's been nice for it yeah so it's really cool. good thank you